How did I know where I was going, beneath the shadow of your fingers, when the sky was a coat sleeve and all the rivers dried to paint? My name is Madeline Lesen. I'm a poet and performance studies scholar from New Orleans, Louisiana, and I've come to London to investigate a story of linked lives from the past via two portraits to which I'm also linked. I'm starting the journey at the National Gallery, where I'm meeting one of the curators, Francesca Whitlam Cooper. So who are we looking at? This is the Col de Vaudreuil. He is a French aristocrat. He is going to go on to become a really important art collector. We have um, several of the paintings that he owned and commissioned here in our collection at the National Gallery. We have works by Poussin, a beautiful self-portrait by the female artist Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun. He's going to become very close friends with Marie Antoinette and that whole kind of aristocratic circle just before the French Revolution. But here at this moment, he's a very young man. He's 18 years old and he's literally just arrived in Paris. Where was he coming from for Paris? So his father was the governor of Saint-Domingue, which is present day Haiti in the Caribbean. Saint-Domingue was then a French colony and his father had been the governor. Um, So he'd grown up there. Their family had extensive plantations there, sugar plantations, which were worked by enslaved people. And it's really that enslaved labor that is the the origin of all his wealth. So it's that labor that very directly paid for this art collection, paid for all the sumptuous things we see in this portrait, paid for the portrait itself. I can sit here talking about this as, as an art historian or a curator, but you have um, a much more personal connection to it. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so Vajoy had a plantation manager named Louis Nicolas Lassen, mm-hmm. who was actually an ancestor of mine. Wow. Lassen ended up having uh, children with an enslaved woman named Charlotte. Mm-hmm. Um, and after the Haitian Revolution, they fled to Jamaica. Okay. From Jamaica, a portion of the family went to New Orleans, where I'm from. Um, but one of their children, Louis Celeste, ended up coming to London. Wow. Now, you've come to London. What does it feel like for you to come to London and see this I mean, in person? It's it's a very bizarre experience um, because we're looking at how ostentatious this is, how the clothes kind of don't fit. It kind of feels like an inventory of his yeah. nice things. But then, you know, we see the map of Saint-Domingue and the other types of property that he owns. So as um, a descendant of that property, it's, yeah, it is it is a bizarre experience to see him as a boy. Mm. And it's, it's what's amazing about having you, you know, come to London and kind of investigate this, because obviously we have this portrait here of Vaudreuil at his most ostentatious, showing, you know, this ill-begotten wealth in, in the most extravagant way. And then but there's another picture, right? At the National Portrait Gallery of Louis Celeste Lassen. It's absolutely crazy that these two people with such different lives, such different experiences, yet so intimately linked, and they would end up, their likenesses would end up in two institutions that share a wall and sit on the same city block. I think we should go and meet Louis Celeste Lassen. Absolutely. So the wind spreads you like seeds into the corner of the sea at Exeter Hall. A hand points to the sky, but you hold steady, eyes ahead. So we thought the painting we were looking at in the National Gallery was really big. Um, I'm overwhelmed sitting in front of this portrait, but I mean portrait on on what a scale. Can you tell me a little bit about what it is we're looking at here? So we are looking at the 1840 Convention of the Anti-Slavery Society, which was the first meeting um, Mm -hmm. to abolish slavery worldwide. Right, because uh, slavery, the slave trade had been abolished in Britain 
1807, and then slavery in British colonies had been abolished in 1833. But I guess this being seven years later in 1840, this is about a kind of worldwide movement, right? I think that's that's what he's commemorating here in this portrait. And I feel like you really get a sense of that. Yeah, absolutely. Just the scale of the painting itself. But I mean, it feels as if the sea of people is too large to be contained mm. by the frame of the painting. That really gives a sense of how big of an issue this is and how much support there is for the worldwide abolishment of slavery. Yeah. And then, of course, in this painting, we have your ancestor, Louis Celeste Le Sen, who's made a similar journey. And he's up here, right? In the- yes, he is in the upper left-hand corner. And I mean... He himself is like a very complicated figure Mm. because even though he's at this uh, convention and was deported to London from Jamaica for maybe stirring uh, abolitionist sentiment, um, he himself owned slaves. And so, um, yeah, so you don't get a sense of that from just looking at this painting. No, that's so complicated. Well, that, but that makes me think about Benjamin Robin Hayden, the artist, because, you know, he's painting this portrait of this convention. He's, he's, he's memorializing this extraordinary moment, but we know that he himself at times holds really racist views. So it's nothing is as, as clear cut as it, as it first seems. Can I ask you what, I've never looked at a portrait and found one of my ancestors in it. What does it feel like for you? Um, You know, I think it has to do with the complexity that we were just talking about, because the fact that we're able to trace back my family Mm -hmm. this far is an extremely privileged position as a person of color, especially as a person of African descent. And I get to be in that position probably because he did own enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we're able to trace our ancestry is tied to that history. Um, So it is a very complicated relationship. This painting is painted in 1841, and it's given to the National Portrait Gallery in 1880 by members of the Anti-Slavery Society Convention. So they give that to a national museum with the view that it'll be here for the public to come and see that it will memorialize and like you said kind of idealize this event but maybe we should go back next door and delve a little more deeply into how the portrait of the Comte de Vaudreuil reaches the National Gallery. Absolutely. As if listening to the ground explain June to winter it's not that I soften if you can believe me So we are now in the Library and Research Centre at the National Gallery with my colleague Nick Smith, who is our brilliant archivist. Nick has dug out some of the documents that uh, relate to how the Comte de Vaudreuil's portrait ended up at the National Gallery. And then we also have here some of the documents that um, the researchers who who first brought us this this kind of story and this whole whole premise of these lives being linked have found um, in the Archive Nationale in France. so obviously we've just been at the National Portrait Gallery looking at Louis Celeste Le Seine. Um, these are documents really relating to his father and also his mother. So this is the um, plan of the plantation that his father, Louis Nicolas Le Seine, managed for the Comte de Vaudreuil. So these are, in a way, the kind of documents that, that link them together. Here we have a bill that... Louis Nicolas sends to the Comte de Vaudreuil in 1789. So that's his signature. And then this document is, I think, much harder to look at. This is an inventory of the enslaved women on that plantation. And here we have, unfortunately, Louis Celeste's mother, Charlotte, mm-hmm. listed as being 27. And the servant. The servant and in good health. Yeah. Um, yeah, this this is a really. I, I find this a, a deeply distressing document to look at. Yeah, I mean, it. I'm speechless seeing it, um, and it's so unfortunate that this is where we find Charlotte's story, um, because 
I'm, I have no words to yeah. describe the kind of feeling of seeing her name um, yeah. in these documents. I mean, it's your family tree. I, I can't imagine what it feels like to you to sit here and look at this. Um, but, you know, these, these bits of historical documentation, they are what help us to kind of piece together all the puzzles. Um, Nick, you have you know, a, a very different selection of archival material here that tells us a little bit more about the Conde de Vaudreuil's portraits. Could you show us some of those things? Yes, I've retrieved the acquisition file for the painting from the archive. And I'd like to share with you some of the documents which tell the story of the painting's acquisition by the National Gallery. And the first is a letter from Lord Crewe to Sir Charles Holmes, the gallery's director. And he reports that he'd had a visit from Baron Emile de Langer, who explained to him that he and his brother were interested in donating the portrait to the gallery in memory of their deceased parents. The portrait had been purchased by Baron de Langer in 1881 at a sale of the Vaudreuil collection. So it stays in Vaudreuil's family for over 100 years and then it, it's bought by the Air Langer family in 1881. That's amazing. Yeah, I find it so interesting that the sugar plantations that probably funded mm. the making of this portrait were also probably what funded the Elanger's family's uh, acquisition of the painting. Uh, what I know about the Erlanger family is that the Baroness de Erlanger was actually from Louisiana. So her family's plantation, Bell Point, including the human chattel um, that her family owned, the sugar that they grew there, mm. uh, would have been what helped to fund the art collection that wow. she and her family acquired. So you have your own connection to Louisiana, right? That's where you grew up? Yes. So that is where I'm from. Um, and I remember earlier when we were talking about uh, the splitting off of the Lassen family when they fled Saint-Domingue. So some went to Jamaica and the other branch of the family went to Louisiana. Hi. So here we can actually see um, a picture of the plantation where the Baroness grew up, which is in uh, Laplace, Louisiana, and not far from the site of the largest slave uprising in U.S. history, wow. um, which happened on another neighboring plantation on the German coast um, of Louisiana. And one of my ancestors actually has a direct link to that plantation. Wow. To me, what makes me feel very kind of hopeful about this story is that we, you know, we have these things, whether they're archives or, or really difficult documents or, or paintings that we have in frames up in the gallery for everyone to come and look at. But, you know, altogether, they're ways of telling a new story and not just retelling history, but maybe reanimating history. And, and that makes me think about you as an artist and your creative response to this material. Can you tell us a little bit maybe about what it was like to write a poem about this? Yeah. Earlier, we were talking about the unfortunate way that Charlotte shows up mm. in the archive and how this is the only piece of her that we have. Um, and as horrifying as it is, it gives me the opportunity as her descendant to kind of imagine alternative stories. And so for me, it was important to think, how do I make a poem that is really um, taking seriously the history, but is also um, imaginative. And so, like, for example, one of the things that um, actually was hugely inspiring was, you know, I was reading about the anti-slavery convention and I found out that it took place in June. For me, as a poet, I'm trying to think about how do I stay true to these historic facts, but also dream what else is possible around them. How did I know where I was going beneath the shadow of your fingers when the sky was a coat sleeve and all the rivers dried to paint? I've heard of the ocean, irises and ambergris, an auger when the soil freezes, one teaspoon of baker's yeast. In late December, 
the branches broke. Sour sop fell to the earth. Is it in the burden of fruit that a branch bows into a latitude? At your feet, a shell of armor, dismembered as an archipelago. Show me the loose thread of your stocking in the darkened parlor, and I promise to pull it into a pipeline at the bottom of the big house in Laplace. Oh, sunrise and palm oil, church pews and molasses, for the mosquitoes that hatch inside the rain bucket out back. We couldn't have guessed how everything would turn so familiar. But I had gotten it wrong every day and every night that a line bends to your knowing, as if hands only run where the eyes tell them to. No, you told me, that's what ships are for, to lay down a field of sugar cane that we might call an astrolabe. So the wind spreads you like seeds into the corner of the sea at Exeter Hall. A hand points to the sky but you hold steady, eyes ahead, as if listening to the ground explain June to winter. It's not that I soften, if you can believe me, more like a yawning mouth and deep red curtains, the humid sigh from somewhere, than light.